maintaining brain health, uh, maintaining brain health, do's and don'ts. This is um, an incredible audience. We see all of you on screen. I recognize a lot of you. Uh, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. It's a very important topic. Um, my name is Robert Gordon. I'm the president of the Chevy Chase Citizens Association. Uh, for those of you who do not know the organization, it's a 113 year old organization. It's the oldest public uh, service organization in Chevy Chase. And I welcome you and I uh, ask you to go to our website to learn more about us. We do a lot uh, in um, public policy. Uh, we do a lot on uh, the um, upcoming uh, elections, a lot of forms. And we're best known perhaps for uh, managing Chevy Chase DC Day. Um, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Chong, who's the executive director of the Northwest Neighbors Village, as well as uh, Dr. Jesse Brand, who's an expert uh, panelist and speaker. Uh, Dr. Brand is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist. Uh, and um, I'm gonna throw this over to Stephanie, who's gonna uh, expand on that introduction. Uh, if you would um, uh, please uh, put yourself on mute. I think everybody is pretty much on mute. Thank you very much for doing that. So Stephanie. Shoot. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Robert, for inviting Northwest Neighbors Village to partner with CCCA once again to bring informative programming to our community. Um, as Robert mentioned, my name is Stephanie Chong. I'm the executive director at Northwest Neighbors Village. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we're a local organization that enables older adults to thrive as they age in community by offering a robust network of resources and opportunities. There are many ways for you to get involved and help Northwest Neighbors Village build a generous and supportive community where all older adults are valued, age with dignity, and enjoy opportunities for growth and engagement. We welcome you to join us as a member, become a volunteer, or both. Please visit our website at www.nnvdc.org for more information. While there, I encourage you to sign up for tomorrow's virtual speaker series Childless Older Americans with Dr. Taylor Bellero. Now to today's program. All participants have been muted. Our presenter will take questions at the end of the program. Please use the chat feature if you have a question. Tonight's program is being recorded and will be available on CCCA's website as well as Northwest Neighbors Village's website later this week. As Robert mentioned, Dr. Jesse Brand is a board certified clinical neurologist Evaluating, evaluating adults with a range of psychiatric, neurological, and medical disorders. His primary specialties include differential diagnos diagnosis of dementia, traumatic brain injury, mild autism, and adult ADHD. We're so excited to have Dr. Brand here today to talk to us about um, cognitive loss and what we can do to take care of our brains now and into the future. Dr. Brand, you're up. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, I'm Dr. Brand, and I'm really excited to be here uh, this evening to talk about brain health and answer whatever questions you have. Uh, at the end, I'm just going to share my screen because I've got some slides to take us through this. Hope you can see that okay. Um, I am a clinical neuropsychologist, um, which means that I'm an expert in thinking abilities um, and cognitive functions and emotional functions and what it, how it all relates to the brain. Uh, I work with a wonderful group of colleagues, uh, neuropsychologists at the Sticks Root Group, um, which is in Silver Spring doing clinical assessments. Um, and before that, I was working for seven years at the Neurology Center, uh, which you uh, may have heard of as a large group of neurology practice in the area. And most of the uh, 
patients that I saw there um, were 65 and older, so I'm mostly coming in to see whether or not they have dementia or on the way. Um, so I've thought a lot about uh, dementia and brain health, and I'm very uh, thrilled to be here to uh, share some of it today. And thank you so much to uh, Stephanie and Robert and uh, Northwest Neighbors Village and the Chevy Chase Citizens Association. So here's uh, an agenda. Uh, what I will be talking about, and I'm just going to go through this. So first, I'll I'll do sort of a primer on how we learn and remember. I think that's important to kind of go over. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we can improve memory and thinking skills sort of outside of dementia. Uh, I'll talk about what's normal versus abnormal memory, which is something we all wonder about. And then I'll go through the do's and don'ts, uh, some false promises in memory improvement, and then how we actually can reduce our risk of dementia. I'll talk about the don'ts before I talk about the do's, uh, just because I want to uh, finish up on a high note. So um, let's first talk about how we learn and remember. So first of all, there are different types of memory processes, different stages of learning and memory. And the first step is actually getting the information to be remembered into our brains somehow. That's called encoding, or you could also think of it as learning. And that's easier said than done sometimes, right? Encoding or learning is dependent on so many different things, including how well we're paying attention, right? Uh, our mood, uh, how well we organize the information, right? And then once we've gotten that information in, the next step is actually storing it or retaining it for later, later use. And that's also easier said than done, right? Because memories tend to decay over time, even in normal aging. And then finally, let's say you've gotten that information in, you've managed to store it pretty well, the last step is to be able to retrieve it or basically finding it in your brain so that you can use it. And another term for retrieval that you might know it as is recall, it's more commonly used. So you can think of memory uh, as a library on uh, the various stages of, of learning and remembering as being done by the librarian. So the book is brought in and it's placed on the librarian's desk and then the librarian processes it and organizes it among the other books. The librarian may put a self-help book in the self-help section and a travel book in the travel section and a book on politics in the horror section and so on. Um, but there are really three main reasons for the librarian being unable to retrieve the book that match up to each stage of memory. So first of all, one, one possibility is that the book wasn't processed to begin with. It was brought to the front desk, but not placed on the shelves. Uh, two, it got processed and placed on a shelf, but someone else has borrowed it and now it's gone. Maybe they're really late in returning it. Maybe they don't even ever intend to return it, but it's just not there. And then three, the book was processed and filed. It's somewhere in the library on a shelf, but it's not possible to locate it or access it. And this is important because we need to understand these stages of memory, of learning and memory, to understand how to measure memory, why we're forgetting, and how to improve memory. And actually, the best way to improve memory is to work on this first stage, making sure it's processed correctly. We just don't quite have the tools yet to work on the other two stages, which are less in our control. We can actually modify this first stage much more um, readily. So what are those things? Well, let's pick up where we left off. Improving memory really mostly involves targeting this first stage of processing, encoding, or learning. So I'm gonna give you an example of a strategy for improving encoding or learning. This is a 16 digit number. I'll give you three seconds to memorize it and that's it, your three seconds is up. How much of it can you remember? Not too much, right? That's okay. You're not supposed to be able to remember that. But I'll show you that these are actually two dates. 
So you've got July 4th, 1776, and December 31st, 2022, the last day of this year. So really, you, you, you really only have to remember three concepts here, right? Which are two dates, and then one switch of the month and day, unless you're not American, it's normal to put the month second for you, which is fine, in which case it's really just the two dates, right? So you're turning 16 pieces of information into three. You could memorize three pieces of information in three seconds. Well, so you may say, so what, Dr. Brand? How often am I really trying to memorize 16 digit numbers uh, in my daily life? And that's true. This is not a perfect correlation with what we encounter each day. We're not being asked to learn 16 digit numbers, but we have overwhelming amounts of information to learn and remember each day. We have requests for future tasks coming in from loved ones and colleagues. We have emails to answer. We have instructions from doctors and accountants and other advisors. Uh, we're taking courses online. We're taking classes online with information we want to remember. We're organizing our home, our desk, our inbox, our paperwork. We're taking in news stories, like it or not, your life is coming at you like this. And if you're retired and you, and you feel like you really don't do that much, okay, maybe you have 12 digits uh, instead of 16, but it's still often more than our brains can take. And I'll tell you, in the past 20 to 30 years, most of you know better than I do, we have placed our brains in an environment that we're really not evolutionarily equipped for. Uh, with all the screens and being indoors so much of the time, even that artificial setting is um, not natural for our brains with expectations for work in our society that goes beyond anything humans have ever uh, been expected to do before. So the more we practice making meaning, building structure, chunking things into smaller pieces and making it look like the way it is now on the screen, the better our cognitive performance is gonna be. And you can do this with anything, uh, but it has to be personalized. It, it has to make sense to you and it takes practice. So um, I want you to try with this one, it's much shorter. I'll leave it up here. I'm not gonna call on anybody. Uh, I won't put anybody on the spot, but just think to yourself how you might remember this number uh, in a personal way give you a, a few seconds. Or the same with this. The principle is the same. So you turn abstract concepts into meaningful, concrete information, and you'll do better cognitively. And I'll tell you how I do this one. I, my son was born on the 14th, my daughter was born on the 28th, so just flip that number. And then all I've got is two concepts and the number six. I've come up with something with a six, I don't know. Um, so, so that's an example of an internal way to improve thinking. It happens inside the mind. And this is the most immediate when you want to remember something specific. You, you can use internal strategies like organizing, chunking information, like in the examples I gave. And I gave that example because it's easy to demonstrate in this format, but there are a number of other strategies uh, out there that you can use. And, and you can buy books that, that will explain some of those strategies as well. The external strategies, these are more mid-range. These are things like moderating or modifying your immediate environment, decluttering a desk or an entire home, uh, using a notebook, using an app, uh, sitting in a quiet place while you're working, and et cetera. Um, even more greenery in our environment, uh, more nature. I mentioned the, the artificial interior. Uh, more greenery, even a plant has been shown to relax our brains and make us more productive, even at work. And, and most of you have probably developed strategies that work for you uh, over the course of your lives. Um, so um, continuing to do that is great because those are practiced and those work for you. Um, and then there's the more macro level, which is changing your lifestyle to help your brain in the long run. And that's where we kind of get into uh, lowering dementia risk. So lifestyle changes 
are the most likely to, if anything, to work on the two later stages of memory, the storage and the retrieval, because you're actually in that way, nurturing your brain cells with lifestyle changes. You're, you're fortifying your library. You're paying your librarian really well, whatever metaphor you want to use. And, and one of the messages that I want to send here um, is that outside of genetics, which you can't really control, you, you're in control of your dementia risk. You can adopt a range of lifestyle changes that, that can significantly reduce that risk. So before we talk about reducing dementia risk, uh, first, I, I think it's important to briefly talk about what is normal versus abnormal memory or thinking abilities in general, and also what the heck dementia is exactly. Uh, so what I mean by thinking abilities and things like, uh, are, are things like remembering, but also paying attention, um, reasoning, planning, speaking, comprehending, understanding. So, so here are some lapses in thinking someone might encounter in daily life. Going into a room and not remembering why, right? Finding the right word to use in conversation. I know, I know what you're thinking. Misplacing your keys or glasses. Trouble paying attention when you're not interested. And forgetting something that you were told a year ago. So I can't see all of you, uh, but just think about who thinks these are cause for concern, major concern. Who thinks these are pretty typical? Well, they are. They are pretty typical. I hear these concerns all the time in my office, and especially um, when I was at the neurology center. These are very common things. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily think that these are, are major causes for concern. And here's an actual scientific paper that looked at a very specific type of cognitive lapse, misplacing something inside the fridge that people see as very troubling, um, which I think highlights how we can really misinterpret our own behavior as something concerning for dementia, though maybe it really shouldn't be. And in fact, research actually shows that we're terrible at judging our own memory. Some studies, the ones over here, show a positive correlation, meaning that more memory concern does mean worse memory. But a lot of studies show a negative correlation, which means more memory concerns means uh, less memory problems, better memories. And then the average of those studies show absolutely no correlation at all, uh, hovering right around the zero here, right? So, so this is, this is a well-known phenomenon that we just don't know exactly how we're doing memory-wise. Um, so I want to show you some other uh, memory problems or other thinking problems, forgetting how to use the phone mistakenly paying the same electric bill three times. Forgetting the name of a close family member. And I mean really forgetting, not trouble just retrieving it in the moment or going through a whole line of family members before you get to the right name. Repeating yourself often with, within the span of a minute. So more cause for concern? Yeah, a little bit more. Um, and these are things that, that I would probably get checked out, right? Um, so these are more abnormal uh, memory problems. Well, what about these? Typical, concerning, forgetting something you were told yesterday, struggling to follow the plot line of a movie, trouble staying on topic in conversation, forgetting the name of a casual acquaintance. So what do you think? It kind of depends, right? These are a little tougher. These are kind of in the middle. Uh, for the first one, well, how important was the thing you were told? Uh, were you actually paying attention when you were told or were you playing a video game, a game on your phone, Candy Crush or something? Uh, struggling to follow the plot line of a movie. Um, you know, was it a kid's movie? Uh, or was it a spy thriller like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy? I couldn't follow that one, and I don't think I have dementia. Um, 
difficulty staying on topic in conversation? Well, well, a lot of people have trouble staying on top topic in conversation. People like to hear themselves talk. Um, so that's not necessarily a problem. How close was the casual acquaintance? Maybe it's not that unusual to forget that name. So, so these are things that also kind of just take a, a bit of a closer look with, with a professional um, and, and getting some objective results. And that's where neuropsychologists come in. So I keep saying this word dementia, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about what dementia actually is, because I do get a lot of questions about that. We're gonna be talking about dementia risk. So dementia is just simply a decline in cognitive ability that's so severe that it makes it hard to take care of your daily tasks and take care of yourself. And it happens after age 18, and it's not something that's reversible, like something we might see in, in depression or, or sleep apnea, right? So one of the most common questions that I got um, or that I get is what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And that, that makes sense as a question because those two terms are so uh, inextricably linked. So what it is, is that Alzheimer's is a disease process that leads to dementia. So Alzheimer's is the actual physical, biological conditioned, characterized by these, these plaques, these amyloid plaques and, and protein tangles. And dementia is really like the symptom or a collection of symptoms, like a, a syndrome. And Alzheimer's happens to be the most common cause of dementia by far. Um, so that's why the two terms are so, um, overlap so much and are almost used interchangeably. But dementia is really an umbrella term, and there are a number of other things that can lead to dementia, uh, including stroke and other cardiovascular problems, Parkinson's and conditions related to Parkinson's. But not all people with these things, these other things, get dementia, right? So. We can use our knowledge of how learning and memory work um, to differentially diagnose people and detect the presence of Alzheimer's rather than something else. So people with most other conditions that affect memory and thinking, um, like say depression or sleep apnea, uh, Parkinson's, vascular disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, things like that, people have trouble processing and retrieving information, but what they do get in stays in there, in their brains. So the storage and retention is mostly intact. On the other hand, people with Alzheimer's also have trouble processing and retrieving the information, but they're also having trouble retaining what they do get in. And that's because the biological underpinnings of Alzheimer's, those plaques and tangles, happen to reside first in our actual memory systems. And then later they, they do spread to the rest of the brain, but it just so happens that they start in the memory systems. So all this is to just kind of give you an overview of what neuropsychologists do in using this knowledge in our cognitive tests to assess the nature and severity of the memory issue. Um, so, we're gonna talk about some of the things that can reduce risk of dementia. Uh, but again, I wanna end with that. So I'm gonna save that for the end. Uh, but first I would like to address a few false promises uh, and talk about the don'ts first. Um, before I do, I do wanna caution that I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. Uh, this is information that I've gathered from the research literature and as the current state of knowledge in neuropsychology itself. Uh, we do know a lot. We pay attention to these things uh, because we're, we're asked about it every day and it involves cognitive functioning. But you know, before taking any major steps, I would, I would speak to a doctor and, and get their opinion. So I, I wanna talk about brain health products. Um, brain health products fill a huge gap um, because actual medications on the market really haven't made good progress. And I'm talking about things like Aricept and Lamenda and Exelon. And there's also, we, we don't have that much time to speak to our doctors or geriatricians about this stuff. And we're also living longer lives. Um, and people care a lot about their brains as they age, which they should. 
Uh, there was a 2012 Marist poll um, and it showed that staying mentally sharp uh, outranks other issues uh, such as social security even and physical health as a priority for older adults. So something's got to give. There's just a ton of demand and very little supply. Um, the brain health product industry is an eight to $10 billion industry and more than 60% of older adults take a supplement for better brain health. But the unfortunate truth is that most brain health products out there have no little to no scientific merit. So I, I don't mean to pick on the ones that I've highlighted here. I'm just picking out the ones that are, are probably most well known. But these, these brain health products do take up time and they take up money and they take up hope um, with little return on investments, just something to keep in mind. Um, so for example, ginkgo biloba, which you, you may have heard of, Im improves memory, maybe reduces dementia risk. Uh, so a, a 2008 paper from JAMA uh, showed that ginkgo biloba showed no benefit for reducing all-cause dementia or dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And here you can see the graph here with ginkgo users in black and a placebo users in gray. And you can see that they're virtually identical, not statistically different in terms of uh, cumulative dementia rates by treatment. So, so how quickly uh, people develop dementia over time. So that's just one, uh, one product, Prevagen. Uh, which you've probably seen on the TV, uh, maybe in the past. Uh, it's this uh, mystical, mysterious uh, substance made from jellyfish uh, deep in the ocean. Uh, you know, seemingly promising. Um, but in 2017, uh, the FTC uh, charged the makers of Prevagen with false and unsubstantiated claims and called it literally, quote, a clear cut fraud. And some of these over-the-counter smart drugs really have so little research that, that we really don't even know if there are interactions necessarily with prescription drugs. Um, so it's not that they're definitely entirely harmless either. Um, brain training games. Brain training games have held lots of promise. Foremost among them is the most well-known Lumosity. Uh, I can't tell you how many questions I've gotten over the years about Lumosity. It looks really fun. Uh, I'm sure it is really fun, uh, but the results just aren't there yet. And in fact, they were slapped with a $50 million penalty for false advertising. Um, that was then reduced to 2 million because they didn't have the money. I don't know the ins and outs, but now they say they don't treat any disease. So do you want something that they say doesn't treat anything? Not necessarily. And here's a sort of study of studies, a meta-analysis and systematic review uh, showing uh, on brain training games from just from last year, uh, showing that while brain training may be suitable for enjoyment and entertainment purposes, there is insufficient empirical evidence, uh, research evidence to support that such training can improve memory, general cognition, or everyday functioning. So while we all desperately want to be able to say that brain training games, especially the ones that are marketed can be helpful, they, they really just mostly teach you how to be good at those games and they don't clearly generalize uh, to real life yet, yet, still working on it. Um, so when I first gave a talk like this, um, I was asked to say a bit about Aduhelm or Aducanumab, which you may have heard of. Um, and I didn't know much about it at all uh, back then, um, but I did take a look into it and I'll just give a, a little review and update on it. So, so this is a monthly intravenous infusion for Alzheimer's disease. And it was found to show cognitive decline, uh, sorry, sl slow cognitive decline by four months uh, in an 18 month period. And the mechanism is based on the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's, which other drugs are like Aricept, and suggests that if you clear out amyloid plaques, you can treat Alzheimer's. But the hypothesis is actually getting weaker and weaker 
as we find out more about Alzheimer's pathology. And in fact, it turns out that clearing amyloid really doesn't do all that much to improve memory or functioning. And the truth is, unfortunately, we don't really fully understand what causes Alzheimer's. And that's the whole thing. That's, that's why we're trying to do so much research into it. We're trying to think that the amyloid buildup is a byproduct of something else. That's the true problem, some third variable. So the, the controversy basically is that Biogen stopped their two clinical trials. And then six months later, they planned to seek FDA approval, even though they thought they wouldn't meet their goals before. And it seemed like they received an unusual amount of assistance from the FDA, uh, cherry picking, massaging their data a little bit. And there's a 33 page document available online. Uh, if you wanna read it yourself, it explains it in much more detail. Um, the FDA started a formal investigation into the approval process. Uh, two major medical centers said they would stop giving the medication or, or wouldn't be giving it. And uh, then a thorough review concluded that there were significant doubts about whether the benefits outweighed the risks. And so basically the decision so far has been that it, it's not going to be covered uh, more or less uh, by CMMS. Uh, so that's, that's the update as of January 22. And again, um, this has been covered in the Times, uh, especially by Pam Bellick, so if, if you want more information about that. So what does work for treating dementia? And I'm talking about treating dementia, not dementia risk. I'm talking about tr treating dementia once it develops. So medication, I mentioned things like Aricept, uh, Namenda, Exelon. These things do work to some extent. They, they turn back the clock uh, six, six months or so, um, a, a neurologist would be, be able to talk to you more about that, but it, it's not a, a silver bullet, unfortunately. So um, that's another reason that I mentioned uh, for the, the brain health products out there. Um, behavior management is really the, the main uh, avenue here. So um, using signs in the home uh, for reminders with big font, uh, things like reducing overstimulation uh, in the home, uh, not arguing with, uh, the, with your loved one, um, reassurance, uh, helping to look for things, even though you're pretty sure it's not actually lost, uh, reflecting feelings. Um, in other words, really getting into their world, getting on their team, and giving a sense of control while at the same time limiting options. So basically a providing structure. That's really the thing that, that works best to, to manage symptoms of dementia. And of course, caregivers are hugely important in this. And there's a lot of strain that goes with that as I'm sure many of you know uh, out there. So um, supporting caregivers so that those pillars uh, stand up uh, strong um, is, a, is a huge part of it as well. And I will tell you that I have not cared for someone with Alzheimer's or any form of dementia before. So while I may have a, a decent you know, academic understanding of what's involved and what some good strategies are, the best information comes from actual caregivers. And so I put uh, here the Alzheimer's Association uh, with the local chapter here. And then this wonderful book, uh, The Bible uh, for Caregivers for uh, People with Dementia, The 36-Hour Day, um, that, that you can pick up uh, if you're interested. Uh, it's got a lot of great resources in there. So it would be really discouraging if that were the end of the story, but there are things we can do to reduce risk of dementia. Um, so we're gonna take a look at each one of these five main areas, um, use it or lose it, reducing risk factors, healthy diet, social networks, and mind and body. And some of these may seem familiar to you, uh, but, but get out your notebooks, get ready to learn. Um, so use it or lose it. Neuroplasticity, or the ability of the brain to adapt, and make new connections occurs throughout life. And so it's never too late. Can't say you're, you're too old for this. You're not too old. Uh, lifestyle complexity is important, but it's got to be new things. It's got to be challenging things. 
So, you know, not just doing the crossword or Sudoku, not just doing your Wordle once a day, not doing your Quartle once a day or your New York Times spelling bee. That just doesn't cut it. That's too routinized. It needs to be challenging. Not so challenging that it's frustrating, uh, but challenging and interesting. Um, as I mentioned, um, cognitive training like Lumosity is not really affected, effective yet, um, but there is a task called the NBAC task um, that's used in a lot of research and it, and it trains your working memory, which is a very important cognitive skill. Um, there actually is good research uh, backing up uh, the NBAC task and um, how it can really actually improve cognitive functioning. Um, I don't know, you know that it's a huge effect, but it does actually do something. And there are apps that you can, you can find uh, using the NBAC, so you can remember that. But, but if you're curious about something, you know, follow that lead. Uh, learn a new instrument, learn a new language, uh, visiting museums, uh, quilting, card playing, even learning how to use your smartphone better is a challenge, right? Uh, if you're interested in that, and, and that may be, uh, that may be a, a good thing to do anyway. So, um, so use it or lose it is one area, reducing risk, risk factors. So what's good for your body is good for your brain. I say that all the time. What's good for the heart and your blood vessels is good for the brain. Why? Because it's all connected and you need a steady flow of blood to the brain to keep it alive and healthy. And the same is true with lungs and oxygen, right? So um, keeping your blood pressure under control, lowering your cholesterol, uh, um, managing sleep apnea, uh, if you have it, or if you're concerned about it, getting a sleep study, uh, not smoking, etc. And actually there's just a huge, huge link between vascular disease and Alzheimer's dementia. And we see both all the time. We very often see a mixed process that involves vascular disease and uh, Alzheimer's. And there's actually even growing evidence that Alzheimer's is actually a type three diabetes uh, with insulin being a clear mediator. So just something to think about that, that very strong link there. Um, also, um, sort of as an aside, but, but hearing aids can help if you're hard of hearing. Um, I know they can be a pain to deal with, uh, but if you're not hearing, you're not uh, stimulating the part of the brain that, that, that processes auditory information, which is the same part of the brain that's affected in Alzheimer's. Um, so you really wanna keep that part of the brain active. And not just that, but if you're not hearing well, as you may know, you're not gonna be as engaged socially. You're gonna be on the periphery. Um, so getting hearing aids can, can be really, really much more important than just being able to hear. Um, so similar, sort of similar to the last slide, a uh, slightly diff different approach is a healthy diet. So uh, you may know some of these diets, but I wanna mention the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. And this is a diet where you're, you're trying to uh, increase your level of certain healthy foods and decreasing unhealthy foods at the same time. So healthy foods are vegetables, nuts, berries, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and wine. Yes, wine uh, in moderation. So that's a good thing. Uh, and according to the MIND diet, uh, and then Unhealthy food groups, red meat, butter and margarine, cheese, pastries and sweets, fried food, and fast food, right? So I know, um, you know, who wants to live without pastries and sweets, but did I mention the wine? Um, so, and then, um, you know, the, the MIND diet is actually found to be superior to the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. But it's, it's really just all about uh, antioxidants and anti-inflammation. And with the Mediterranean diet, um, research shows a 40% lower risk of dementia. And then again, something to, to talk to your doctor about, not, not run out and do it, 
uh, but intermittent fasting. So the idea that um, you eat only at prescribed times of the day, like a lot of people do eight hours. So you're only eating within an eight hour window um, and then not eating at all uh, the rest of the 24 hours actually shows in the research to have a profound slowing of aging. So something to ask your doctor about as well. Um, similarly, exercise is so important for the brain. We know it's important for the body, but it's important for the brain. And there's also a wealth of research uh, that shows meditation uh, can maintain and improve cognitive function. And this actually all has more support in the literature than you might even expect. Um, it, it's not just about quality of life and well-being. It really impacts the actual brain molecules and synapses and structure and everything. Um, you don't need to run a marathon. You don't need to run a half marathon or a 5K. Just 30 minutes a day of moderate exercise, 20 minutes of vigorous exercise three days a week if you want to go that route. Outside exercise is better than inside exercise because when you're exercising outside, you're being stimulated more. You're looking around, you're seeing things, and um, you're also having to avoid, uh, you know, and walk around things, which actually stimulates your brain more. Uh, another thing, uh, if you're interested in, to ask your doctor about is HIT. Uh, H-I-I-T or high in, a high intensity interval training also can work uh, very well. And then, but you know, it doesn't have to be jogging or walking, it can be dancing if you enjoy dancing or, or other exercises. And in terms of meditation, you know, you don't have to achieve nirvana, right? Um, just 10 minutes a day is fine. And that, I think that's what stops people from from meditating is they, they feel like, oh, I didn't have you know, this mind blowing experience. I'm just talking about sitting and for 10 minutes and just kind of watching your thoughts go by. You can do that. Um, so, so yeah, both of those things are, are great. Uh, social networks are just so important. I can't say enough about it. Um, Twitter followers do not count as a social network, Facebook, Instagram, None of those things count. Has to be close ties. So things like attending community events, seeing your friends, actually friendships are, are actually more important than family members for these purposes because they take more engagement. They take more effort to maintain. And actually in studies of, of the super agers, uh, the people who are in their 80s who have cognitive functioning like people much younger than them, they all have in common that they have intact social networks. And it's not that they have intact social networks because they're super agers. It actually works in the reverse as well. Okay. Okay. So you may say, well, Dr. Brand, I, I don't have time for all these things. And I get that. So one thing you can try to do is engage in activities that cover multiple slices of this pie. So for example, volunteer work. Think of all the slices of pie that gives you uh, volunteering with movement and social interaction, exercising with a friend, which, which many of you may do, taking a vigorous walk outside with a friend is very good for your brain. Um, joining a book club, uh, taking a, a cooking class, these, these social challenges, uh, ballroom dancing, tai chi, yoga. So, so the message again is that you are in control. You can reduce your risk. And, and these things are just good for, for well-being anyway, and mood. Um, and the future uh, of all of this is really specific uh, developed programs that, that combine a lot of these uh, slices of pie that people are developing uh, now. And there's one more way, I'm kind of running out of time. There's one more way we can improve cognitive functioning. And this is part of the future too, changing our mindset and reducing our anxiety not only about dementia, but, but just about normal aging too. You know, we're, we're taught throughout our lives that getting older means losing our capacities. When, if you really look at normal aging graphs, it really doesn't show that. Yes, there's a kernel of truth. We may get a little bit slower and have trouble coming up with words a little bit more and other things. Um, but, but studies show that negative stereotypes of what it means to age 
can actually detract from our abilities in a very real way. And that if our mindsets are modified, people perform better on cognitive tasks and on motor tasks even. And one of these studies measured positive and negative age beliefs in old, older adults, followed them over time and saw who developed dementia. And you would be amazed, even controlling for so many things, age, sex, race, education, marital status, smoking history, cognitive functioning at baseline, so nobody had dementia, and depression, they found that positive age belief was associated with a 43% uh, lower risk of developing dementia. Uh, and you can see here that a lot of this research was done by a psychologist, Becca Levy at Yale, uh, but, but there are others as well. So you can imagine the implications of this for the future. Yes, we could develop individual interventions uh, to bolster positive beliefs about aging, uh, especially in those who have the most negative beliefs, but, but we could also work to combat societal level uh, age beliefs as well. And so I would add one more level to the model I showed you way back, uh, a sort of macro level societal method in uh, battling uh, structural ageism. And so just to kind of recap what I've just told you, there are different stages of learning and memory that help us determine what might be causing memory problems and, and how severe it is. There are multiple levels of intervention in improving cognitive performance. There are both normal and or abnormal thinking problems uh, that neuropsychologists can kind of help you tease apart. Uh, to be careful about the promises of brain health products. And again, these are things to, to ask your, your doctors and other treatment providers about if you're, if you're interested in them. Um, just going into it with, with eyes wide open. And that there are multiple ways uh, to lower your risk of dementia. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for uh, your attention. I wish I could see all of you at the same time. I can't, but um, happy to take any questions. I put my email address there, my office's phone number um, for, for any uh, referrals or any, uh, anybody who needs a, a clinical uh, assessment. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brand. I have to say, not only was your program informative, it was also very encouraging and um, yeah. empowering to hear yes. that there are things that we can do and there are actually fun things that we can do. <laughs> it's it's right. not all, you know, ugh, a chore. We can yes. really enjoy um, right. some of these uh, lifestyle uh, changes. And um, I, I particularly love your rebellious um, number four of, working to um, dispel the stereotypes of aging, which uh, I think our country has a long way to go, but I think everybody in this room should be the first to start really paving the way. Absolutely. Uh, we have some really great questions in the chat, so I'll just go through. Um, anybody, if you have more questions, just keep throwing them in here and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, the first question is, does music or sound in general have an effect on the brain? Well, like I said, I mean, it, sound does have an effect on the brain. It, it keeps our brain active um, in, in all the right places, you might say. Um, but music also does as well. I mean, um, there's there are such things as, as music therapy out there. Uh, there's a bunch of music therapists around here. I've even flirted with going into music therapy. My I come from a very musical background. Um, so I thought about that, but, but yes, it, it can affect the brain. I, I don't know about actual plasticity with music, but it certainly affects um, mood and well being. So I wonder if, um, and I could be totally off on this, but with that question, uh, there are videos and, and studies of um, people who have rather progressed dementia who listen mm -hmm. to music and sort of come to life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you, can you elaborate well, yes, on that? Yes. Yes. So, so for people with dementia, what it does is it, it can sort of help trigger memories um, and, and help you access them, especially long-term 
memories, you know, as, as you probably all know, um, hearing a song, hearing a piece of music will trigger a memory for you right away. Um, so those, you know, those pathways are very well connected. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think in dementia that's used to often music therapy, uh, often I, I, I didn't mention that, but yeah. And um, speaking of one of some of the do, someone was asking, what about the value or of pets? Pets, okay, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I guess it might depend on the pet and your closeness to the pet, but absolutely, if you're, if you're close to a dog, if you're having to, um, and I just, I say dog because that's what comes into my head, but uh, you know, you're, you're having to take care of it. It's a, it's a challenge, not just that, but it's a companion. Um, uh, absolutely. If you're, you're talking to them and communicating with them, I think there's, there's certainly no harm and it could be helpful. Yeah. I, I would just add, um, I used to work in senior living and we mm -hmm. had a dog and, and I'm using this example to, um, to really sort of exemplify or highlight your earlier um, part of the presentation when you talked about behavior and environment and mm. this woman wouldn't get out of bed for anybody, none of the mm. caregivers or staff. Um, mm. But when the dog came in and nudged her little wet nose on her arm, she got out of bed every morning. And yeah. depending on the individual, uh, it could actually be a really useful Absolutely. companion. Yeah, and that's, and that's why hospitals have pet therapy as well, just like music therapy. So yeah, yeah. Um, this question about um, determining risk. How important is genetics in determining risk for dementia? Yeah, that's a great question and a common question. Um, so if we're talking about late onset dementia, dementia in you know the 70s and 80s, um, there is a genetic component. Um, most of that is uh, through a gene uh, called ApoE uh, and the allele called ApoE4, um, and that increases risk. Um, and if you have one of those alleles or one of those genes, then, then you have somewhat increased risk. And if you have both, then you have more uh, risk. And, you, and I think you, you can get uh, tested, and most people don't. But um, so that's, that's for late onset and that's a component, but, but just having those genes absolutely does not mean that you will develop dementia. What's more genetically linked is what you may have heard of a, a familial or uh, early onset uh, Alzheimer's where, where you're, you're seeing symptoms in, in maybe the 40s or 50s. That, that has a much a higher genetic link. Um, and that's something that, that you would want to know about and you would, you would probably know anyway uh, because you saw a family member go through it. Um, but I, I do think that sometimes the late onset and the early onset uh, types of Alzheimer's get conflated and people think that uh, late onset is more genetic than, than it actually is. Um, but, but short answer, uh, yes, there is a genetic component, but it's not everything, especially for late onset. And going on with the conversation about risk, does reducing risk of dementia also reduce the risk of getting Alzheimer's? Or can you not reduce the risk of Alzheimer's? So <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. You, if you reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, you reduce the risk of dementia because they Alzheimer's causes dementia. Um, but um, yeah, it's it, what you can do is also reduce the risk of uh, expressing the Alzheimer's pathology, right? So you can have Alzheimer's type pathology uh, without actually showing any symptoms. And some people, you know, uh, go through their lives and for one reason or another, uh, after death, that Alzheimer's pathology is found um, and, and there was really no sign of it. So really building up brain and challenging yourself, some, a concept we call cognitive reserve, um, can help you kind of uh, suppress the signs of the actual biological disease. So that's what I would say to that. A lot of questions or comments in the chat about uh, different programs to participate in 
and mm. um, I can certainly go through them individually, but what raises the, the larger question is how do we trust, how do we know which programs to trust to invest our time in mm. to, um, to, to take some of these preventive measures? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly. I wouldn't be able to tell you a list of, of programs in the area. And that's something um, that you would go to, you know, the Alzheimer's Association website or, or other websites to, to check out. Um, I, I would put more stock in doing something that, that you enjoy uh, and, and doing something that, that challenges you, whether it's within a program or not. Um, and, you know, you can check out a program and if it's, if it's not for you, um, you know, I would say then it's not, not for you and don't continue. Um, but I would say you can create your own programs um, and uh, do it on your own or, or with some friends. Um, so, but, but, but there are, there, there should be some programs out there that I'm, I'm sure you could um, try out. And if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Someone mentioned the Goodwin House has a stronger memory program that I know okay. a lot of folks have um, participated yeah. in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly as I'm listening to you, I, you know, just about everything you talk about with regard to socialization and opportunities for exercise and mm -hmm. a gathering over a meal and so forth, or, or the volunteerism are all things that are also available um, at local villages that you can do often free of charge, depending on yeah. how you get involved. So if you're interested in learning more about what the villages offer, please um, feel free to reach out. Um, there was a comment about the intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And um, could you repeat the times of day? Yeah. It <laughs> coincides with what I know about, I know I'm going to butcher it, Ayurveda. <laughs> Did I pronounce that correctly? What is it? Just go ahead and talk about okay. that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, intermittent fasting is just, is based on the idea that, um, you know, as we were evolving and as we were early humans, we didn't have uh, access to food at all times. We're not really meant to just constantly eat throughout the day. Um, and so what we do to our bodies is kind of unnatural when, you know, we're eating whenever we want. Um, so that that's kind of the idea behind it, and the 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 practice is basically eating within a certain prescribed uh, period of time during the day. Set you know eight hours. Say you can choose the hours. Uh, say you know ten a.m. to six p.m. Don't eat before ten, and don't eat after six. It's actually not that hard, um, you know, and it really just means delaying breakfast and not snacking at night, basically. Um, but, but actually the research suggests that, that it can really slow aging. Uh, there's, there's actually, there's more research than you would expect on that. Again, I would, I would ask your doctor if it's all right for you. I, I wouldn't recommend it right here, um, but it's just something to keep in mind and to ask about. I hope that answers it. Brand, can you tell us uh, what would be um, an appropriate referral to our neuropsychologist? When uh, when would we call you for help? Yeah, yes, that's a good question. Referrals are made, um, and that's kind of why I went through the abnormal versus normal memory lapses because we all have memory lapses, and you know our our brains are made up of. Uh, electricity and chemicals and tissue. There's no way we're going to be perfect at all times. We're going to have lapses. But what we do is we're able to uh, take those lapses, listen to all your difficulties, the difficulties that you're having, um, and then give objective tests where we compare your performance to other people, your same age, your, with your same education level, sometimes with your same uh, gender, and really uh, compare you to people who look just like you and see where you fall on all these uh, measures and see if we're dealing with something that really truly is uh, abnormal and, and what might be causing it based on your profile and based on all the stuff that we learned about you. Very holistic 
approach. Uh, we do a long interview and really try to understand uh, the full person and how that matches up to the actual test scores. Um, so, so a good referral would be anytime that you're noticing problems um, just in daily life, problems with memory, problems with attention, language, whatever, anything that the brain does, and you wanna just get a more objective snapshot of, of what your brain functioning looks like and is it something to be concerned about. And, and usually, usually a, a, a neurologist or a psychologist, psychiatrist or primary care doctor will help make that decision and, and make that referral, so. So much. We, at this hour went by very fast. Mm -hmm. It was so informative. Okay. Um, really great questions from uh, the yes. attendees today. Uh, there was a lot of information. I saw, see, saw some things in the chat um, with requests about um, you know, will the transcript be available and so forth? Um, I can try, <laughs> try to learn something new, <laughs> which would be good for my brain, and see if I'm if I can download it and email it to everybody in um, in the program today. If not, this program will be recorded and on um, CCCA's website and Northwest Neighbors um, website later this week. Uh, and you can watch it, pause, you know, take down notes um, and so forth, share it with people who you think could really benefit from this information. Um, Dr. Brand, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you thank all you so much. for um, making time this evening to join us. Uh, Robert, do you have any parting words before we conclude? I'm very grateful. This was uh, so informative. Um, it's great, and I, I look forward to actually reviewing it again. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna post it on our website, and we'll we'll have a chance to really dissect it, figure it out. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you too, and thank you all. <laughs> have a great evening, everybody. Take good care of yourselves. Good night. Thank you, thank you. This was excellent, Stephanie. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Brandt. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. Good night.